Carrie Sackville, I am so thrilled to have you on the podcast. Congratulations on your latest book, The Life-Changing Magic of a Little Bit of Mess. So many questions. Now, I have to say, <laughs> I was in the cafe reading your book and I've, I've read, I was reading your book in a number of places, but that was the place that was in public. And I'm just laughing out loud. Oh, I'm you know. so glad. Honestly, and I'm just smirking and I'm going... <clears throat> you know, <laughs> and I swear that the people next to me were just wondering, mm, you know, what's going on with this woman, but you, it, it was just so much fun to read. Absolutely loved it. Now, before I go on to talk about your life as a writer and how you wrote the book and all of that, please give listeners just a brief idea of what this book is about. Okay. So in lockdown last year, I was sent a copy of a book um, which, oh, you know, as writers, we often get copies of books sent to us. Um, it's like one of the great perks of being a writer. Obviously, as you know, there are no other perks to being a writer. That's the <laughs> only one. Um, and it was great. It was nonfiction. I really like nonfiction. I enjoy learning about topics that I know nothing about. And this one was about cleaning. So I definitely knew nothing about that. <laughs> and it was all about how to keep your house spotless and, and, you know, the different products for different areas of the home and you need an aspirational pantry with everything labelled and you need colour-coded bookshelves and this is, the, you know, this is how you clean your skirting boards. I mean, I didn't even know what a skirting board was at that point. <laughs> and I was just thinking, really, you know, this is what we need in the <laughs> pandemic as if life is not hard enough. So I decided to write an antidote to basically the hashtag home inspo influencers and the cleaning bloggers and the whole Murray Kondo kind of throw out everything you own and live in a steer sad life um, <laughs> with two possessions. Um, and that's what I did. So I wrote um, a Bible of domestic imperfection. So it's really about the joy of letting your standards slip um, and embracing mess. And I just wanted something really funny that would give people a laugh because I think we need that right now. Yeah, I certainly absolutely. Now, I've got lots of questions about the book, but I want to give listeners some context. So bear with me. I'm Because I've known you for some years. You have. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. So you actually started life off not as a writer, but as a social worker. That's and right. then you went into writing and you were writing for publications like the Australian Jewish News and a number of different publications. Then you discovered blogging and social media. And that's how the world came to know Kerry Sackville because... Yeah. You know, your blog was really popular. You were so active on social media. And that ended up being a book, um, My Husband, well, my does, husband the, does the Dishes. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then you also started being a columnist um, at Sunday Life and you wrote for other um, yeah. publications as well, including Mamma Mia and a number of other publications. And then, like, what is this, four books later? Is that Yeah, right? this is number four, yeah. This is the yeah. fourth book. Yeah. So now we've come to this, but you're not blogging as frequently or as before, you know. Um, I just want to know, I mean, okay, so you're known for your wit and your humour. And, and, um, my, and my radiant youthful face. Of course, yes, about. of course. <laughs> and great observations on um, kind of like social behaviour because throughout this book, I, I kept thinking she writes about the things that we all actually really think but don't even kind of know we're thinking. And then you just read and you go, oh, my God, yes. And the next paragraph, oh, my God, yes. And the next paragraph, that is so true. Where did that come from? Because, you know, writing for the Australian Jewish News, I can imagine <laughs> that you weren't writing about those sorts of things. Yeah, I actually was. So really? one of my first columns for the Jewish News was about the Judah, which is basically, you know, the Gada, how gay people can spot each other in the street. Well, the Judah was Jewish people can spot each other in the street. So it was always that kind of observational right. um, little, little things that, that maybe other people can relate to but haven't actually thought of. And um, I was doing that then with, I think I started off with, um, parenting magazine. So I was writing about, about mm. parenting and, and having kids and their marriage in the context of parenting. And honestly, I think it's just the way my brain works. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I just, things happen to me that probably happen to everybody, but I see a story in it. Um, and mm. I'm really lucky in that I can do that because I literally have no other skills. Like I was a really <laughs> bad social worker. 
<laughs> you know, I was just really <laughs> intolerant. It's like, yes, yes, you've got problems, I know, but but kind of, you know, push through, please. Um, <laughs> and um, and so it's it's the writing. There are two aspects to writing like this. Like one of them is the actual realization of the idea. So you get an idea and and you know you have the capacity to write it. There are a lot of people who are really good writers. Um, but the, the part that I think is most important for me, for the work I do, is just getting that little idea. So finding something in kind of the very, very mundane life that I have, because really, I mean, what do I do most of the time? I sit in front of the computer and I deal with my children and go to Westfield. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's finding the, the, the story, the hook in really just mundane, everyday events mm. um, like you know, that's in the book, like trying to clean a mark on my ceiling. You know, I was, I was lying in bed and I noticed a handprint on the ceiling and my daughter had been jumping up and down on the bed and left this tiny little handprint on the ceiling. And I thought, oh, I can clean that. Um, and I kind of got a ladder out and I was on the bed and I was scrubbing and I ended up making like a massive, massive mess, like a huge grey cloud where there was like a tiny handprint. And I ended up having to get the ceiling repainted. Um, so that kind of thing, actually, that kind of thing probably doesn't happen to everyone because not everybody is quite as domestically <laughs> challenged as me. But, you know, it's weaving a story out of that kind of thing. So you obviously have to do that with your columns as well, yeah. right? And you have to do it on a regular basis. Yeah. You have a deadline. You have to yeah. deliver. Yeah. So my question then is do you find that mundane thing and when you start writing sometimes goes, actually, that's just too mundane. <laughs> do you have to give up because you the, the story doesn't come from it or do you already know before you start writing where it's going to go? God, that's a good question. Honestly, I would say these days 90% of my work is is me walking around the block, like thinking. It's all about thinking. By the time I sit down at the computer, it's there. The whole thing is there um, in terms of my columns anyway, and I literally just write it up. Um, so there are times when I'll think of something and think here's a here's a good idea and that it just doesn't have legs. That you always need a hook and it's mm. just not interesting enough. It doesn't have a strong enough angle. I write a lot of op-eds, and mm. the key to writing op-eds is you've got to have a really really strong point of view. Um, but then on the other hand, it's got to be a point of view that you can completely justify and that you can kind of embed mm. the opposite argument in it because you're constantly anticipating what people are going to say in response. Yes. So you want to embed that in your argument. And if it's not strong enough, then the idea doesn't have legs and I kind of let it go. Um, but by the time I sit down at the computer, it's, I would say, probably 99.9 times out of 100, it's there and it comes out. Mm. Um, I very rarely have to, in, in all my career, I very rarely abandon something halfway. But remember, there's a lot of ideas that I get that I sort of walk around and I'm thinking about, like, no, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. With, with the book, um, you know, you know, if you've read it, um, that there's a hook to the book. Mm. It's not just a book about, you know, a, an antidote to cleaning and tidying. There's kind of a hook that runs all the way through. And until I had that, I wasn't sure if the book was was strong enough without mm. it. And so I had to find the hook. And once I got that, it was like the rest just kind of flowed. Um, but okay. it's finding that angle. Yes. So writing a column, though, which is yeah. maybe 800 words or thereabouts. Yeah. Often less now, often less. And sometimes less, yes. Yeah. Um, is very different to writing. How many thousand words is this book? About? I think that's about, it's a, that's a short one. I think it's about 55. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but writing 55, even though that's 55, short, writing 55,000. Not just 55 thousand, words. Yeah. <laughs> that would be bad value for a book. Yeah. So 55,000 words is very yeah. different to 800 or 600 words, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the book. You you say that you did it as an antidote to this other book that, you know, yes. that, that you got about cleanliness and cleaning. But then to actually write 55,000 words on it yeah. is kind of massive. Take me through the steps of, you know, even though you had the idea, you still yeah. had to kind of write some stuff and propose the idea. Tell me about yeah. the actual process to publication. Yeah. So, so once I had the idea, I literally wrote a proposal really quickly. It was like it was literally sitting down and jotting down all these ideas and I felt like I had masses of ideas. And I've also written a lot of columns in the past about my kind of domestically challenged ways. So I'd written a column about, about the, the um, ceiling incident. I'd written a column about the time when my oven exploded after I tried to take it apart watching a YouTube video and then put it back together wrong. Um, I'd written columns about how I hate cooking and all my cooking disasters. And on Twitter, I was constantly tweeting about burning myself and gashing myself, you know, doing household things. So 
I felt like I had a lot of ideas and I sort of jotted them all down, proposed the, the idea, got it accepted, and then there was a really short deadline. There was literally like a five-month deadline because they okay, wanted to get on, it out. Let's backtrack. You you wrote the proposal. Really so you wrote quickly. the pro- proposal but hadn't you, you must have provided some of those previous columns. Uh, yes, so exactly. That, yes, as so that, that they course, had an yeah. indication. Yeah. Okay, so that, right, and they knew great. who I was. The, yes. the publisher knew who I was. She was familiar with my work. Fantastic. So then I got the I got it, um, I got it through, had five months to write it, which is incredibly short. Um and then once I sat down, you, you feel like you've got a lot of material and then you realise exactly what you said. This is not good. This isn't 55,000 words. <laughs> this is like two pages. <laughs> so that's when I kind of panicked. So I spent about a month of that five months completely panicking, thinking, oh, shit, what have I done? I can't do this. And I would literally go for these long walks, um, you know, with my mask on because it was all, you know, it was all lockdown and and just think, what is the angle here? Like, what am I missing? Didn't have kind of the, the narrative thread that would connect mm. all these different stories. And then I got it. Mm. And I, it literally took about a month. And once I got it, it really did start to flow. And I got to a point where, where there was probably about 40,000 words. And then I had to, and that just raced through that. And I wrote it during lockdown so that I had my three kids at home. So two yeah. adult kids and my teenager. And they were like my beta readers. They didn't want to be my beta readers. They were just trapped there. They had to be my beta readers. And I kind of throw out jokes to them and and they are tough. Like kids are really tough. So if they laughed, I knew I was onto something. But a lot of the time it'd be like, yeah, mum, yeah, yeah. Maybe old people will find this funny. Um, but then but then occasionally they would really laugh. I think, yeah, yeah, I've got it. Um, but then I got to the point where I had about 40,000 words and it's like this isn't enough and that's when I started digging really deep. Um, and I came up with, you'll see there's graphs and there's charts yes. and there's recipes. And, yes. and that's when you're really sort of thinking, how can I kind of get every last drop out of this idea? And then when I was talking to the publicist about doing publicity for the book, I said to her, um, because usually what happens is you're asked to write things about, you know, about the topic. And it, I said, I have nothing left. Yeah, like right. you can run extracts. I have nothing left. I have put everything I have into that book, every last joke, every last kind of funny anecdote about me, about other people, about the whole cleaning world. I was researching, like I was spending hours kind of looking at, at you know, inspirational Instagrammers who are, who are <laughs> showing their, you know, spotless bathrooms and doing three-hour cleaning videos and, and looking at ads for different cleaning products and just trying to get kind of ideas for how else I can milk this topic. And I'm actually really, really happy with how it, how it turned out. Um, but there was, you know, out of that five months, I would say three months was just pure joy. And then two months was just wringing my, wringing my hands and tearing my hair and like scratching at my eyeballs. Like, ah, um, so it the does first, feel, it was the first satisfying. month was searching for the narrative. Yes, exactly. The, the narrative thread. So yes. let's, so you, you got, when you were ready to go, when you thought, yeah. okay, I've got it now, what did you do? do because did you divide it up into I'm going to write this number of words per week or how did you you know plan it out so I actually came up very early with the chapter headings um which I I really like I've I've got sort of funny plays on old proverbs and idioms and and um you know like um what's what's one of my favorites so um Laugh and the world laughs with you. Clean and you clean alone. You know that kind of thing. So, so oh, to clean or not to clean? That is the question. So I divide up in the, into the chapter headings, and then basically every time I had an idea, I'd kind of slot it into one of the areas. And then, of course, in the editing process, you know, I was working with a really great editor at Harper Collins, and and then you start shuffling things around, and they're like, I'm not sure that goes there. I think that goes into this one, and but really, that's how I did it. And there was also, I don't mean to sound kind of. Um, wanky here but there was there was a lot of trying to get into the voice um, because writing humor is a particular kind of writing um, where you almost have to really I kind of had to sit down and relax and just let it flow it's not something that you can force if the, the more you try to be funny mm. the less funny you are you can't you know if someone says quick make a joke you can't but if you're just relaxed and sort of allowing kind of your natural sense of humor to to be able to come out, then usually it works. Not every, not every day. You know, there were times when I'd sit down and think I'm going to, you know, write today and it'd be like, no, I'm just not, I'm not feeling funny today. But then there'd be days where I, it would just kind of 
flow. And, and even having the kids there, I could sort of start just, you know, talking to them about a topic and even just having them to bounce off. Mm. It's kind of really helpful and I just kind of things would pop into my head and, yeah. But writing humour is not new to you. You're very good at it and you've done it lots of times before. So don't you have a way of just yeah. getting into that Yes, voice? yes, and that's what it is. It's, 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 I can only describe it as a process of relaxation. Right. Um, when I'm writing serious op-eds, mm. I'm very focused and I'm constantly thinking of usually what people, how people would argue with me. So when you're making an argument, you know, you've really got to be very cogent. You have to know exactly the points you're going to hit. Um, and more than anything, you have to anticipate what the argument's going to be. Yes. With humour, it's different. With humour, it's literally just sitting and relaxing and trying to just almost be in conversation with myself if that makes sense. So I'm saying something and then I hear what I would say in return because usually I spark off other people. Like the times I'm funniest are the times when I'm around funny people and then they're saying something funny and I bounce back and it's kind of kind of like that tennis match where mm. one person lobs a ball and the other person lobs it back, but I'm doing it with myself. Um, and, and if you're tense or if I'm tense, if I'm trying too hard, it shuts it down. So I really have to relax and just go with it. And that's fine when I'm writing columns and I've got 600 words to write and I've got a day or two to write it. When you know you've got to kind of get an entire book in it, that's what freaks you out. So it's a thinking, I have to do this because time is ticking away. So you really have to shut out all of those voices and just go, ah, it's just me making jokes and being funny. And I try really hard. I try with everything I write to write what I would like to read. But Mm. in this case, I was writing what I think is funny. And I would mm. just sit and laugh. And I knew that it was going well when I would just crack myself up. And sometimes it was like I had this whole process where I'd be like, oh, shit, oh, shit, I can't do this. And then I'd be like, I'm a comedic goddess. Like it would be <laughs> going from one to the other. So and at any it, point did you, you know, when you wrote a particular chapter or a particular section, did you read it back and go, there just aren't enough funny bits in here and I really need to think of more and insert them? Often I, I do that, but it, with this book, no, because the whole point was to be funny. There's an underlying theme to it. Mm. It's not just cracking jokes. The underlying theme is, of is really what underlies all my work, which is that we don't need to be perfect and yes. you don't need a perfect life and you don't need a perfect home. And there's sort of a bit about feminism kind of very subtly hidden in there in one of the chapters as well. Um, but in this book, the whole point was to be funny. So I didn't write, like it was literally just writing humor and so no I I have to be honest I was either not writing or I'd write something funny and I tend to be I don't know if everybody's like this I I I tend to read back my work literally the next day and I can't remember writing it when it goes well so Mm. you know you'll ask me what I wrote in a column last week and I I usually can't tell you and so I was I tend to be reading over going wow that's really funny and even now I'll pick (laughs) it up and go god that's really clever um it's it's as I said it's my it's my one skill so one would hope that it would it would work because if this doesn't if this doesn't work out for me I've got nothing like, <laughs> all right so because when you know I'm reading say the first few chapters and I'm laughing out loud after a point I actually thought will she be able to sustain this? Because have, yeah. has she put all of her funny bits, you know, like when you watch the movie trailer yeah, of a yeah, movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. all the good bits are in the yeah. movie trailer. So I'm thinking, will she be able to keep on going and have so much humour in it? Because it's it's like it's like bang, bang. It's just laugh out yeah. loud like a lot. And you do. Oh, good. So <laughs> what, what are your tips to people on how to maintain and sustain that frequent, you know, that that oh. that level. Look, as I said, it, it was a voice that I found, but then some of the funny bits are right at the end. Like there's a couple of recipes in there which every time I, I look at them, I laugh. Like I just, I just felt, I mean, my kids roll their eyes, but um, but I kind of think they're really funny. Um, and there's the Venn diagrams, which are right towards the end. I just love. It's a very short bit, but it's right towards the end of the book. Um, I think the key for me was when I wasn't feeling it, I just didn't write that day Um, because humour is something, as I said, that can't be forced. And, you know, I'm working on something now that is nonfiction that's much more serious and I can really feel like, God, I don't want to do this today, but I can sit down and push my way through and just Mm -hmm. know I've got to hit these points and work really hard. But humour just doesn't work like that. You literally can't do it. 
um, what you can do is, um, I guess, um, encourage your, your, it's called the default motor network, which is your kind of daydreaming, the daydreaming side of your brain, the side that's, that's responsible for ideas and humour and creativity. And the best thing to do for me is to get up from my computer, do something completely different. And I spend a lot of time where I feel like I'm being creative, but to someone else, I'm literally pottering around my house or mm. going for walks around the block. And the number of times when I would sit down and just be stuck and think, I have no idea what I'm going to say next. And I would literally get up and go for a walk around the block and think about something else and listen to a podcast. And halfway around the block, I'd be like, that's it. And I would stand there and, and literally dictate it into my dictaphone mm. on the phone um, mm. and come back and, and just kind of um, transcribe it from that. So it's like literally walking away from what you're doing and thinking about something completely different. And that's where ideas are born. Um, so did you yeah. ever get, you know, in the same way people get writer's block, did you ever get funny block or humour block or Yeah, whatever? no, definitely. There were days when I just did not feel funny. Not that for like a long, you know, a, no. for a sustained period that made you go, oh, my God, what, where's it gone? Yeah, not, not with this one. I did get to a point after this. So I had that one month of trying to come up with the hook. And I wrote things in, but I just didn't have the whole kind of cohesive narrative structure in my head. And then three months of just because it was <laughs> so much. And the, like the cleaning and tidying and home inspo in industry is huge. And I just yes. kept finding new things to make fun of, you know, <laughs> like I just, when I found out about, about the whole colour coding <laughs> bookshelves thing, like that's a real thing. And then getting into the whole, like I had a real thing for the aspirational pantries like these people literally decanting everything everything yes. about decanting like you take your flour and you decant it into a jar and then you have to label it flour and your sugar and you have to put sugar on it and then you have to put it in a certain kind of order and <laughs> and you know watching people do their cleaning and talk so earnestly about it and so I just kept finding new and fascinating things to, to make fun of I remember finding the day I found out about Swedish death cleaning oh, that was yeah. just like a gift you know Swedish <laughs> death cleaning is where you know Marie Kondo is about throwing at anything that doesn't bring you joy so that you can have a minimalist house. But Swedish death cleaning is throwing at anything that won't bring your children joy so that when you pass away, your children won't have to do it for you. And I'm like, that's not going to work for me because I really like my stuff. And then I thought, well, what about if my parents want to do that? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll bring them the garbage bags. Like, great idea. <laughs> you know, again, it was just there's so much to make fun of. So it was there was a lot to do. And then for that last month, it was like, okay, I'm almost there, but the book's just not quite quite long enough. Um, I need more material. And there was a lot of time spent just thinking, okay, could I do a graph about this or what's a what's a way I could I could do this? And and even sort of I started to read a lot of comedy. Um, I, I often read nonfiction, but I started to read just comedic books. Um, uh -huh. I started to to watch comedies um, just again to help kind of get in the voice, start to look at comedic Instagram accounts, just anything that would kind of get that flowing. Um, and, yeah, I got there in the, in the end. But there were there were definitely days where I was just, like, thinking, shit, what have I signed up for? But then the feeling of, of triumph when you, when you find something yes. is just so great. Mm. Um, and I have to say, out of all my books, this is the one that I feel most, I, I, yeah, that feeling of, of, accomplishment like god I yeah, did it right. like I took a topic that isn't necessarily obviously funny and found ways to to make it funny yes uh, yeah yes so with the um I mentioned earlier that you have this acute social observation skill kind of thing because you're writing about things that people do and that people say that you know it, uh, well uh, are not only funny but they're 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 just so on point and they are things that we don't necessarily talk about but once you articulate mm. them you go mm. oh my god yes so what do you do to hone that skill I think it's been really really interested in people I've always been completely fascinated by people and relationships between people. And I think that's why I did social work. And as I said, mm. I wasn't a great social worker. Honestly, when I was doing social work, I was in my early 20s. I had no life experience. And I was trying to counsel people who were a lot older than me. And I just had no clue what I was doing. Um, but I always have had that, that sense of fascination with people. And always my favourite books, my, like my favourite novels, are always about relationships. Um, so it's not, you know, thrillers or, or 
um, sci-fi. It's just about the relationships between mm. people. And so I think when you're genuinely interested in that, you notice things. So, you know, I'm whenever I'm with couples, you know, I'll be looking at the interactions between them and trying to work out what the dynamic is and, and why they're reacting the way they are and very interested in friendships and, and looking at the ways that people relate to others, um, very interested in kind of the, the parenting-child dynamic and, and, you know, why people parent differently and, and what children take from their parents. So I guess when you're really interested in something, you, you spend a lot of time thinking about it and so you make observations um, so it's also, I'm not a, be... I'm not a, yeah. no no you go I'm just I'm not scared to talk about any of that either so you know my second book was about anxiety and now there's so much written about anxiety but at the time mm. I was one of the first books to the you know I was one of the first people to write about anxiety mm. um and you know now of course it's I'm not saying I started the wave I just happened to get early in on the zeitgeist mm. Um, so it's it's noticing things and being prepared to talk about it. And now everybody's talking about marriage and motherhood. But really, when I wrote my first book, that was the first kind of wave of people talking about these things. Yes. But it's one thing to be interested in something because, you know, and that's, I mean, yes, of course, you need to be interested in it. But it's another thing to then um, put it into words in a way yeah. that is so on point. Yeah. And when you say you're not afraid to talk about it, who do you talk about it to? <laughs> like, because then it becomes like a, a conversation and really you articulate it. So who Everyone. do you talk about it to? Really? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. Um, this is what I'm interested in. But, but in particular, I've always talked a lot to my mum. So she and I will talk endlessly about the people we meet and the people we know and, and the dynamics between people. Um, I talk to my best friends about it. Um, so again, we're forever talking about people and oh, why they act the way they do, and 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 famous people as well. I've always been really interested in celebrity and and kind of the whole um, concept of of how fame changes you and and how politics corrupts you. And and you know, now that I've got a partner, I've had a partner for the last about um, six months, and I talk endlessly to him about everybody that I introduce him to. <laughs> so I'm like, this is what I think. Ugh. Now, what do you think? And so waiting to see his reaction. It's just something that really interests me and it doesn't interest everybody. So, mm. you know, when I'm at home with my parents, if I try and have these conversations about people around my dad, he's like, really? Like he'll, he's much more interested in politics or in, you know, mm. in world events, whereas I want to talk about the minutia of how people think and how they act and, and why, they, why they act the way they, they do. Mm. I, so let, let's talk about the um, feeding it in because you, okay, so you wrote this during <clears throat> lockdown, but you also have other responsibilities. You have a column to write, you write other things. What did you do on a practical level to fit it all in or, or did you focus on this like 100%? No, I didn't focus on 100%. I was still writing columns and I was mm. literally at home with three kids and I have to run <laughs> the household. Um, mm. It probably won't come as a great surprise to you that my house is <laughs> kind of messy at times and that the standards of housework slipped even more while I was writing. Um, and, you know, I know it's shocking. It's really shocking. Um, my, my skirting boards were not dusted during that whole five months or, in fact, probably the five years before that. Um, <laughs> but, no, I, and I've never been one to have a proper writing routine. So I'm always interested mm -hmm. to hear, you know, other writers who say I get up every morning at 6 o'clock and I write my 1,000 words before the kids get up. I've never done that. Um, I literally, you know, because I started writing, um, I really started pro my professional writing career when I had two kids under the age of two. Sorry, that's not true. I had, no, I had two kids under the age of, sorry, of three. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always written in um, little snatches of time when I found it. So mm. um, I'll literally find, I, I don't need like a stretch of five hours clear to write. I can sit down and write for half an hour and then put it down and do something else. And, and you know, I was constantly being interrupted. I mean, we live in an apartment and my kids did not want to spend all of their time in their rooms um, because that gets really depressing. So really most of us were in our one living area at any mm. given time and I'll put on earphones and just work with them around me and then, you know, my daughter would come out and ask for help with her maths or my other daughter would want to chat or my son would come through and want food and it was hard. You have to be able to kind of dip in and out and, mm. and work in short snatches of time and I'm lucky that my brain works that way. But also this, this book lent itself to that. You know, when you're when you're working with short chapters and humour, you really can kind of write 
you know, a few hundred words and then mm. stop and pick it up. It's not, I'm not a novelist. I can't even imagine how that would work with writing a novel. <laughs> I imagine to keep that whole world in your head, you would need to have some, you know, solid, mm. uninterrupted time, um, which is probably why I don't write novels. Um, <laughs> also, I'm not very good at making things up. Um, so it was literally just dipping in and out. But I did, I was very aware of the fact that I had this deadline and I had to get a certain amount done and I had the whole kind of chart of how many words I'd done every day and trying, uh-huh. to, trying to hit that total. Um, and so I knew, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I knew I had to write a certain number of words every day. And sometimes I would write more and I'd feel like this great sense of relief so that then if the next day I didn't make it or if occasionally I had to have a, a day off because I couldn't think of anything yeah. um, or I just couldn't find my funny bone, then yeah. it was okay. So I kind of like to bank up a few extra words. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't that I would sit down and try and write a certain amount of words, but I just knew how I was tracking. Um, So for people who, I mean, there are many people who are very familiar with your column, but for some people who aren't, can you just describe, how would you describe your column? Like your mandate for your column, what um, you write? So I generally, so I write op-eds, but it's usually about kind of some aspect of human behaviour. Um, I'm not writing about Russia's, you know, invasion of, of mm-hmm. the Ukraine, but I'll be mm-hmm. writing, I, I write about yeah, kind of aspects of, of human behaviour and how we relate to each other. I write a lot of humour and I really try to write about um, the kind of, um, as the kind of observational stuff that, that people will read and think, yes, like I can relate to that. So, okay, so my last column, so I lie, I can remember my last column. My last column um, was about parenting when you've got COVID and you're meant to be looking after a kid with COVID as well and how unfair that was. Um, <laughs> you know, really, someone should have come in and looked after me. Mm. Um, and so it was, it was about that. And um, so it's really about, about um, the things in life that, that people um, can relate to. And it's all the underlying message of everything I write is to try and, I guess, help people feel better about their own lives by making fun of mine, or by talking about the, the problems that, that we all have or the issues that we all have. And since the very beginning, I mean, it wasn't articulated as much as, as in this book, but it really is about how it's okay to have a messy life. You know, we all do and we're all just doing our best. And it's okay. In my first book was about how it's okay not to be a perfect parent or a perfect partner. And the second one was it's okay, you know, to have mental health struggles. Um, and the third one, which was about dating in midlife, because by then I divorced, um, was about how, you know, it's okay to be making catastrophic mistakes on the dating scene. So it's yeah. all really, that's, that's, I think, the underlying message that, that underpins everything I write. So I know that I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but um, a lot of people love, well, they love your column and they love that kind of writing. So what would you say your top three tips are for writing a good column? Oh, wow. Okay. So the first one is you need a really, really strong thesis. So when you want to write something, whether it's an observational thing like I wrote about COVID or whether it's an opinion piece, you have to really have a strong point of view. Um, The times where where I've floundered in what I've been writing is when I really didn't know what I was trying to say. Occasionally, because I've been writing for a long time, occasionally I'll get a call from an editor saying, hey, Kerry, do you want to write about such and such? Um, Do you have you know, do you have thoughts on it? That's what they'll always say. So mm. for people who think that, you know, the newspapers have have um, agendas and they're picking someone to write that way, they, don't, they literally would just say, do you have thoughts on it? And whatever your thoughts are, you know, you mm. can write about it. Mm. Um, but sometimes I just don't. Like there are things <laughs> that I just don't feel particularly strongly sure. about, you know? Yes, of course. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, in that case, it's actually better not to do it because yeah. if you write a wishy-washy column, no one's interested in reading that. People really want to have a really strong point of view. So that's mm. the first one. The second is um, to try and have some narrative flow. And I do a lot of kind of circular endings. So I'll, you mm. know, refer to something in the beginning and then kind of come back to it at the end because I like it all to be, as much as I, my life is messy, I like my columns to be quite tight. Yes. So, you know, you come back to the point, I can't stand columns where, you'll read it and it just kind of stops at the end of like nothing. Nowhere, I know. And I hate Mm -hmm. that. So I always want to have a really strong conclusion and I like Mm. columns that that have that. Um, And the other thing is what I alluded to before, which is when you're writing columns, first of all, you have to have a really thick skin. Mm. Anyone in, in the media has to have a really thick skin, but you really have to try and anticipate what people are going to say. Mm. And there are times when, like, I feel like it's on me to be able to think of that and to be able to respond to that. 
But there are times when you just can't. So that column that I wrote that I was telling you about with the COVID thing, that started from a tweet, um, Mm -hmm. which was something along the lines of, um, I'm supposed to be looking after my kid who has COVID, even though I have COVID myself. This seems unreasonable. Can someone check the rules? (laughs) And like most people got it and thought it was funny, but there was a handful of people who were like, absolutely vitriolic like like oh you shouldn't be a parent your poor children they should be taken away from you oh my god you know you can never anticipate how somebody is going to react Um, there'll always be a small group of people who like willfully misunderstand you I mean it's almost like you have to try really really hard to get that one wrong like rules where are the parenting rules I didn't get the help um but in general you have to really think like people who really mess up on, on Twitter or in columns who kind of get masses of hate, mm. you, have to, you have to really think about what you're doing and always pause. And I always have, always, always for my columns, have a beta reader. It's mm. often my mum. She's, she's not a writer, but she's a really great reader. Mm. And I'll just send it to her because she's the kind of person who'll be reading the columns. Mm. And yes. just to check, and she's honest with me, there's no point having a beta reader who isn't honest with you. Yep someone who just says, oh, yeah, that's great. That's not Mm. actually helpful. So she will always say to me, Kez, that's terrific. Or she'll say, but just, you know, that one line there, Mm. I'm just not sure what you meant by that. Or have you thought that that might be inflammatory or that can be misread? And that is so important. So even if I'm on a deadline, like often, you know, I'll get a call or I'll pitch an idea and they'll say, hey, can you turn over in two hours? Yeah. You know, because they want to run it that evening. If I'm on a deadline, I will find someone to read it because there's often things that you just can't see because you're too close to it Mm. or you think is hysterical or you think is a really great point and it actually doesn't quite work. So you need need a reader because the way that we we think and write, as much as my idea I might think is spot on, if it's Mm. not conveyed in the right way, if there's something that can be misconstrued, you want to pick it up early. That's great. A good beta reader is like... Absolutely essential and not a yes man. Yes, great advice. This is shit. So this book is, you know, going to go nuts. It's fantastic. Are you working on the next one? I am. So I'm actually working on something that I have, uh, it's nonfiction. It's about a much more serious idea Um, and it's something that I have been brewing for a long, long time. And this came out of a conversation with my agent where I, I kind of went to her and I pitched an idea about why people get into bad relationships. And I was chatting to her and I was you know, saying a lot of it is about the fear of being alone. Um, and she was like, that's what you need to write about. So I'm actually writing a book about solitude oh, and how yeah. little time most of us spend with ourselves, with our own thoughts. Um, wow. I'm just so interested in that. You know, we, when you and I were growing up, we would like if we were walking to the bus stop or if we were sitting in a queue or standing in a queue, if we were sitting in a, in a waiting room, what would we be doing? We'd just be thinking. Yeah. We have an alternative. And now nobody's alone with their thoughts or very few people are because, you know, we're always like yeah. on our phones. Yeah. So I'm, I'm writing about that. And that wow. my next book. Yeah. That is so different. That's going to yeah. be fascinating. I hope so. There's a, there's a lot of information out there and, and, um, like a lot of research and and I have a lot of thoughts about it. So that's, yeah, that's what I'm wow. up to next. Well, in the meantime, people are going to enjoy the life-changing magic of a little bit of mess. What do you want people to, when they read the book, to feel or do? Honestly, I want people to laugh. Yeah. Like I really want to give people a couple of hours break or a few hours break from the news cycle, which is so hard at the moment it's so grim I think we all just need a break and to be able to laugh and have fun you can flip through this you can read it in whatever order you want you know there's there's some visual gags which are very easy there's illustrations which are amazing um and the other thing is I just want people to know that it's okay to be imperfect you don't have to be a perfect person you don't have to have a perfect home you don't have to like dust your light fittings or have a housework schedule or make sure that your toilet is pristine nothing is going to happen you know if there's like a bit of I don't know like a bit of dust on your skirting boards or if there's a pile of laundry in the floor like I promise you no one has ever got to the end of their life and said God, I wish I'd spent more time with my steam mop when I had the chance, you know. (laughs) No one's ever fallen in love with someone because they had, like, a colour-coded bookshelf. It's just (laughs) not important. There's so many other things you can do with your life. 
And on that note, congratulations on your book and thank you so much for your time today, Kerry. Such a joy. <laughs>